Hello and welcome to the Marina Skewer podcast. It's been a bit longer than it should have been since the last episode. This one's a week late because last week was completely mad and I wanted to make sure that I could set aside enough time for the podcast to enjoy it and not feel really rushed. Because um, I like recording because, I well I've met, probably mentioned before that this is my full-time job, um, doing knitting related things. Um, and I work from home and so I spend a lot of time just in the house on my own and it is really nice to be able to talk about what I'm working on and that gives, it's nice as a sort of overview so I can look at the things I've finished, that I've achieved, that I've begun since the last episode and that is a nice little bit of perspective and I think it's, it's a nice way to work um, and I hadn't really foreseen that as something that the podcast would bring into my working practice when I started it but it is really nice to enjoy that so yeah so it's June which is good fun I love June um, here in the UK it means that we get some really long lovely days um, the longest day is the 21st which is my birthday uh, and so there are just lots of good things in June um, we well we've been having some really weirdly muggy weather here um, which means that although well I like to get at the dye pots but the idea is a bit just so much extra steam and humidity in the kitchen and yeah um, however despite that I have been dyeing up some new things um, so I'll start off showing you the new things in the shop uh, well on the web shop um, so I've got three new colours in Mendip DK, uh, which is a range I launched at the beginning of last month. Um, so these colours are by far the darkest ones in the in the range, and I think they add like a really nice uh, sort of depth of tone to the whole range because I, I like to think of colour ranges as a whole so that you can combine colours in lots of ways because I. As much I, I love colour but I also love combining colours and seeing which colours work together and I have quite specific tastes um, and but I, I try to not die exclusively within those because I realised that that would be massively limiting. Um, but so these colours I they work really nicely with all the other colours because they're darker and more sort of neutral um, so we've got night, which is this gorgeous sort of, it's, it's, in some lights it's navy, but it's a tiny bit lighter than navy. It's, it's a lovely, um, sort of slightly greeny blue that I really enjoy. And that, it, it basically functions as a neutral. Um, it goes really well with pretty much all the other colours. Um, and then we've got coal, which is like a charcoal -y, really dark grey, like there's a tiny bit of actual black in there but mostly it's just very dark grey. Um, and that, like this one, like some of the colours in the range are more s semi solid than others, um, which is something I quite like. Some have a bit more dimensionality to them um, and I enjoy that. And so, I, like with this one, I, th I think the slight bits where you have lighter bits in the yarn make it more interesting as a very dark grey because I find it a difficult colour to wear. Um, and I know a lot of people struggle to knit with it because it, like very dark grey or black, it, it can just be very hard to see what you're doing. And so it just adds a little bit more interest there. Um, and so that will work beautifully with everything because, like, yeah. Uh, and then this is Beach, which is named after the Copper Beach rather than your standard, like, lush, springy green. Um, and I really struggle to describe it because it's, like, if, if you had to give it one colour, it, it would probably be brown. But it's got, like, it's got pinky, like, almost pinky purpley bits in it and then bits that are a bit more yellow. Um, and that's kind of where the you see the light through copper beaches and they're not a uniform colour, like some of that really deep sort of burgundy colour and then 
on some leaves and some areas of the tree often it's quite localized um there's a, a more of a sort of greeny yellowy hue to it um and so that's what i tried to capture in this and i think i've done quite nicely if i say so myself um and so it's it's sort of it's like like a brown with interest it sort of verges on burgundy um but yeah so i love that if you go over to my Instagram, if you want to see how they work with the rest of the range, I've got some photos of various colour combinations, um, so you can see how they fit in um, and which other colours I think they work nicely with. Um, but yeah, and then another one. This one was, well, these are the only two skeins I have left of this colour, because uh, it's a limited edition one that I did for my birthday. Um, so it's called Birthday because, you know, I'm super inventive with my naming. Um, yeah, basically I let myself go to the dye pots, get a load of yarn ready and then just mix the colours as I went and dye what I feel like without having to worry about making recipes and making sure it's repeatable. So I just did the one batch um, and these are the only ones that are left now. Um, which is really nice because um, it's, it's sort of slightly affirming to know that when I do the colours that I meet like I realise sort of fairly strong burnt kind of orange sort of mapley spicy colour it's not necessarily for everyone um, but it's really nice to see that people have enjoyed it and I mean like it's super predictable if you know me and my colour tastes you probably know that I really love orange um, and this is the first time in quite a long time that I've actually done variegated yarn. Um, so because I've been doing more solids and semi-solids. Um, but this, it was loads of fun to dye and I, I really, really enjoyed it. And because it was received quite well, I'm thinking of doing more sort of one-off batches but doing little collections maybe around a theme um i've seen well i did a little poll on instagram to see if there was any interest for that and it seems like people are excited about the idea so i think that's going to be something i'm going to be working on over the next couple of months and i'll see how that goes um because i'm super excited about it i i do like to have a good strong repeatable range because like it's, it's nice to be able to get a colour that you like again even if that batch has sold out um, like obviously with hand dyed yarn and small batches there there are going to be inconsistencies because that's just the way it works like two skeins from different batches aren't going to look the same um, but like the colour fundamentally should be unless you're holding them side by side it should look like the same colour um, However, I, I have mentioned before that I like to keep fun in my dyeing. Production dyeing gets a bit, not dull, but repetitive. Um, and so I like to inject some fun in it where I can. And I think doing the occasional uh, one-off batches will be really nice. Um, so on to knitting and things I've been working on. Um, I finally finished my Leo Michel, which I was... I've been working on, I think in the last couple of episodes, it's, it took me a good while, um, even though it's not difficult and it's, oh, um, it's, it's very, very mindless and it's, it's fairly, like, it's a DK weight yarn, so it's not fine, um, but I was just using it as sort of TV knitting, and so it's really nice to have it finished. Um, I really like the way the stripes have worked, because they're not super... You can see, hopefully there, with the stitch pattern, like you have the teal coming through the yellow stripes and so they're not really strong stripes and they're a bit irregular, so they don't repeat at any stage because, yeah, um, I like that little bit of unpredictability and I like, so the construction, it actually starts down here. You start down here with a few stitches and then you increase along this edge and you end up oops, up here. Um, and yeah, 
and then you use the long edge like that. That's how I wear it. It's a nice um, lightweight summer shawl, um, which I found really good for, you know, with the weird unpredictable weather we've been having, um, just throwing on for a bit of extra warmth, uh, probably mostly in the evenings. Um, but yes, the yarn is Fiberco Luma, and the colours I've used are Blue Dusk and Golden Mossa. And I am going to be writing up the pattern for this within the next couple of days and putting it up for test knitting. So if you're interested, I've been saying this for a long time, um, but it is actually going to be written up and going out soon. Um, so if you're interested in test knitting, then do go over to my website and sign up for the test knitters newsletter and then you will get a notification when I'm actually gathering test knitters and signing them up for the project because um, yeah it's a super fun one and it's nice and easy once you've got the rhythm of it and also like I mean I've designed it so that it uses up as much of the yarn as possible because I don't I don't like yarn waste um, I like this little detail on the tip here where you've got the yellow of the bind off with the teal of the um, working edge there. I think that's quite nice. Um, so yeah, I do like, I like the little details. Um, don't know if you can see there, it's got a nice little islety edge. Um, but yeah, so I'm pleased with that one. It's, it's pretty and it's very much my summer colours. Um, I love all kinds of greeny, bluey, tealy, sea foamy, sagey colours for summer and yeah that one's really good um, so it works amazingly with a lot of things I already have. Um, things I'm working on, I'm being very good with like not casting on too many things which is weird for me um, because like this time last year I probably had about seven things on the needles and that's that's too many seven is too many for me like I know some people have like 15 or 20 projects in the background and I can't cope with that like it just ends up being associated with massive feelings of guilt um however I'm only working on two things at the moment and that feels like too few uh so I am going to be casting on some new things quite soon um First up, we've got a nice little pair of socks which I'm designing. Uh, the yarn is Hey Mama Wolf uh, sock yarn number four. Um, this colour again is one that's really difficult to describe. It's sort of purpley, bluey, grey. Yeah, it's got some variegation to it, but quite subtle because I like subtle variegation. Um, and. I'm doing two at a time, always. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, two at a time socks, toe up. The only way I will ever make socks. Uh, because again, it means that I can use up the whole ball of yarn. Because um, I'm going, you know, I'll just keep going until I've run out. And then I'll bind off. Like, it's, it's a nice way to do it. I was going to do an afterthought heel. Um, but again, it meant I would have to guess how much yarn I'd need for it. Um, so, I don't know if you can see, there's like, it's a really difficult colour to show off. So there are diagonal, sort of little, from the side, they almost look like mountain ranges. Just like chum 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 chum. Um, which I really like. I've got a slip stitch thing going on on the sole, which I'll talk more about when I'm getting to the point where I'm ready to... Um, put the pattern out for testing. Um, short row heel. I like a short row heel. I don't like a flap and gusset, mostly just because I find them a pain to knit. Uh, and then uh, the the sort of ziggy zaggy triangly pattern that goes up the side of the foot, then carries on up the leg and goes onto the back as well, um, which you can't really see yet because I've not done much of it. Um, but I'm hoping to get these finished soon. Um, partly so I can wear them. Uh, and also so I can write up the pattern and release them. 
and also because I have another pair of socks queued up. Um, I got this yarn at Edinburgh Yarn Festival. Um, it's Whistle Bear Cuthbert Sock um, and the colour is called Inner Flame. Nope, sorry, Inner Fawn. Um, and it's sort of, it's a nice kind of salmony, peachy, pinky orange, um, which I'm a real fan of at the moment. It's, I think it's more pink than I would have gone in the past, um, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. And I'm going to be knitting, oh, let's have a look, can I find the pattern? Had to actually find the pattern. Um, and I'm going to be knitting the Meltemi sock. I want to say that like Meltiemi because it sounds like a Russian word to me, but I, I don't think it is. Um, the next one is a better photo. And they've got this really nice diagonal detail up the front of the foot and leg, which is really nice, and I think that's going to be very pretty. Um, and this is from Breeze by Making Stories. Um, and it's they're running a knit along at the moment it's already started it started i think last week um but i'm going to make myself finish these first partially because i need the needles um but also i don't want to be knitting multiple pairs of socks at once because they that doesn't make sense i like to have different projects on the go so that if i don't feel like knitting socks i can work on a jumper which brings me onto the jumper i'm knitting um, this one is, like, I have some, I have a fair bit of hand spun yarn, like, not loads, I don't have a massive stash, um, but I do have hand spun that I have spun over the last few years that I haven't used, um, and I have lots of single skeins, um, so this one I really love, it's pure blue faced Leicester. Um, the designer, no, the dyer is, I don't think she's dying anymore. I think she's spun plum and I don't, I don't think she's around anymore. Um, if someone is, please correct me. Uh, but yeah, so I have one skein of a hundred grams and I was trying to work out how I could use it. And I've, I did a bit of swatching and I reckon I can get a jumper out of it, which is ambitious, but I'm combining it with this, which is a similar weight, um, even though it's a different spinning style and different fibre and everything. Um, this is a grey version of my Mend It 4-ply yarn, so this one's a pure Shetland. Um, I don't actually have the grey one available uh on the website or anything but i might actually make this available because it's super nice and it's a beautiful natural gray which also goes with the gray of the mendip dk is not exactly the same gray because it's different wool um is from the same flock um but this is pure shetland um and it is actually gray wool uh whereas this is Lam it's the lamb's wool and it's a blend of white and very dark coloured wool um, but you know having a grey a mid grey in both weights would be quite nice so I might I might wind up some skeins with that because I only have it on cone um, so yeah I'm working on these I'm alternating rounds so it has the effect of both lengthening the hand spun, so I get a lot more fabric out of it. Um, and also it softens the stripes of the hand spun where the colour um, changes happen. And I quite like that because I don't, I don't like a really strong stripe um, with hand spun. I, I find it can look quite chaotic. And also the fact that the sleeves aren't going to match. So we've got a green sleeve and a sort of bluey turquoise sleeve at the moment. Um, but I think the grey sort of softens everything and it's really nice. And so I'm working it in a seed stitch, uh, like a moss stitch. Um, I, I always get weird about terminology there because seed and moss mean different things in different places. 
Um, so I'm doing the raglan lines in stockinette and then the rest in seed stitch. And I'm doing the sleeves first, as I have done on previous jumpers when I've not been quite sure how much yarn I'm going to be using. Um, because I'd, I'm more picky about my sleeve length than the body length of a jumper, so I will get the sleeves to the correct length, finish those, and then carry on and do the body and just knit it until I run out of yarn. It might be that I end up with a bit of a cropped jumper, but as I'm working quite a, at quite a loose gauge, um, it'll be quite a sort of springy open fabric. Um, I'm aiming for it to be a summery, springy, transitional weather jumper anyway. Um, and I'm going to be doing the cuffs, neckline and hem just in the grey. Again, like, partially because it means that, like, I don't have a limitation of the grey, like, I have plenty of it, so I'm not going to run out. And also, I think that'll just sort of bring everything together. I think it'll make it look quite nice and finished prettily. Um, so again, this, yeah, it's just a background one. I'm not a super f massive fan of doing sleeves. Sleeves are a bit boring. Um... But, yeah, doing two at a time, as always, because it means I get them to exactly the same length and I don't finish one sleeve and then have to do another bloody sleeve. Uh, I mark my decreases. Uh, can you see there? The little stitch markers. Where's this one gone? There we go. Um, just so I can see visually how far apart they are and it means that I don't have to worry about counting them. Um, but, yeah, so that's... That's a fun one, I'm enjoying that. Uh, I do really like working with hand spun. Um, and I was partially inspired to start using up some of my hand spun because of the spin and make along that uh, Grace of Babbles Travelling Yarns and Mina of Knitting It Expat are doing. Um, so they're, they're encouraging people to you know, make things out of the yarn you spin, which I think is really lovely because spinning is sort of a craft in itself and I really enjoy that, but so often I end up with a lot of hands fun that doesn't get used and so it's nice to be using up yarn that I already have, which is also another uh, knit along that is happening by, it's, it's being run by um, me and Simone on Instagram, sort of in response to a blog post by Yawol Rotterdam. I'm probably saying that wrongly. Um, but they, Saskia posted a really interesting blog post which I, like it resonated quite a lot with me as someone who dyes and sells yarn but also doesn't like excessive consumerism and materialism. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. I'll I'll add a link to the blog post um, and to me and Simone's account because then, well, it's the concept of the knit along is to basically use up yarn you already have, uh, which I like. I'm not I'm not on a complete like moratorium on yarn buying. I bought a skein of Triskelion yarns sock yarn last week because it was released on my birthday and I love the colours that Catherine's doing and that like I had spotted the colour the colours in the new collection and it's absolutely gorgeous so I have treated myself to a skein of that um bec well because I said at the beginning of this year that I was going to be working on socks using natural sock yarn so this one is Merino and Raimi, this one is Mohair and Wensleydale, um, and I think the Triskelion Silfing Sock is, I want to say Gotland and Blueface Leicester, maybe with some Wensleydale in there, but maybe not. I think it depends. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that showing up, and I need more socks, I've talked more about my socks in the past and the fact that I wear through them because I wear them an enormous amount. I wear boots a lot um, and I don't have enough socks that I've knit myself um, and so even in summer I often end up wearing wool socks around the house because I prefer them to slippers. I find slippers flappy and annoying and they come off. Um, 
But yeah, that was a bit of a ramble. Um, yes, and I haven't even talked about what I'm going to be talking about in the rest of the episode. Um, so I'm going to be dyeing up some yarn using some eucalyptus leaves. Um, and I have no idea how that's going to go because I've never used eucalyptus before. Um, I'm going to do another little garden tour because it has sort of exploded since last time. Um, if you saw the last episode, I showed a little bit around the garden and it was all looking, you know, uh, summer hadn't properly hit yet. But now there's an enormous amount of colour and it's good fun and a really lovely place to be and I'll show you some of the dye plants I've got out there. And so yeah, I hope you enjoy. Recently I've not been doing as much natural dyeing as I'd like to just because I've had a load of other commitments. Um, but last week Katie Green of the Green Bean podcast, which you might know, um, was around to try out a bit of lichen dyeing. So she has been collecting lichen on her walks uh, on Dartmoor and near where she lives. Um, and she had seen that I was dying with lichen and so she came round so we could give it a go and that was a nice little reintroduction um, after a bit of a break and I thought I would use some of these eucalyptus leaves um, which is a material I've wanted to try for quite a while because um, it's it can yield some amazing colours and especially if you um, are interested in eco printing, um, it, which has some incredibly beautiful results. I'm often jealous of the ones by dyers in Australia just because of the local colours they have in their plants, uh, which of course includes a lot of eucalyptus. Um, these were given to me by Rhea Burns, who is a friend of mine who's a wonderfully talented and skilled natural dyer, she's very knowledgeable, and she, um, I think these were just prunings from a neighbour or someone that she saw, and she basically filled up her car with as many eucalyptus branches as she possibly could, um, and so has given me this bag, um, which is really kind, and I'm excited to try them out. So they are dried, um, they make the most wonderful crunchy noise. Oh, maybe I should just do eucalyptus leaf ASMR. <laughs> um, so these are dried out. Um, some of the leaves are massive. Um, and they're, they're beautiful. Um, and so I'm going to give them a go. I've got just over 300 grams here. And so I'm going to be doing my usual method. using one of the big pots because I've got quite a lot of material here. Um, and if you are interested in natural dyeing, do make sure to always use separate pots for dyeing and eating because um, not all, in fact many dye stuffs are not food safe. Um, so we've got quite a nice half pan full there, a bit more actually. Um, so as usual, I'm not going to tear these up because I think it, it won't actually help that much with increasing the surface area. I'm expecting to need more boiling water to cover the leaves. Yeah. And you can see that's already compressed quite a bit where I think the leaves have softened with the water and that smells absolutely incredible. A lot of the time the smell of natural dyes can be slightly unpleasant um, just because, well, not all plants smell good and when you're cooking them and heating them up it can get a bit disgusting um, but this smells really amazing like it's that really strong eucalyptusy smell um, 
I don't know if you can see there, but with the first bit of water I've put in there, there's already a teeny bit of yellowy colour, which is encouraging. Because um, often the colour doesn't start showing until it's been on the heat for a while. And I think with that I'm going to add one more kettle full of boiling water and then I will put it on the hob to heat up for about an hour. Um, I'll bring it to the boil and then let it simmer um, and while I'm doing that I will mordant my yarn so I've got um, th just over 300 grams here so I'll go for 300 grams of yarn because when trying out new things I always like to uh, new dye stuffs I always like to use the same amount of dye stuff as weight of fibre um, because generally that's a fairly good ratio, you, it gives a good indication of how much colour you get. And Apparently eucalyptus dye is substantive, which means that it shouldn't require a mordant to stick to the fibre. Um, that's often the case with um, things that have a lot of tannin in them. Um, but I'm going to use alum anyway because apparently, especially with eucalyptus dyes, it can help to freshen and brighten up the colours a bit. So I'm going to be preparing my usual mordant of alum and cream of tartar and I'll be doing that at the same time as heating this on the hob. And then we will see what kind of colour it yields.
I'm going to do a little garden update. It's very windy up here today uh, and it's a gorgeous sunny day, um, not a cloud in the sky. Um, I am sorry if there is noise from wind or from neighbours mowing their lawns. I've tried to find a break in all of the mowing and stuff, but we'll see. So I've got my little collection of pots on the edge of the deck here. Um, in terms of dye plants, this is my madder. It's doing okay. Um, I'm not, because I've never grown madder before. This is another one. Um, I don't really know how big they're meant to be at this stage, um, but they seem to be doing fine. And they're not very impressive plants above ground because all of the interest is in the roots. So we'll see how that goes. Um, nice nasturtiums. I've got nasturtiums everywhere. I love it. Um, some here. We've got quince there, which is a bit sprawly, but it's really taken off this year, which is nice. And that on the left there is a blackthorn um, with a stray euphorbia at the bottom, which I've just not got rid of. That's a very blown about hydrangea, which is just about to bloom. It's going to have big palms of white flowers, which I'm excited about. And then we have calendula literally everywhere, um, which I'm super excited about. Um, we've got some sorrel there, which has bolted. Uh, so we're going to clear that out and eat the remaining leaves soon. Um, the purple sprouting broccoli is looking amazing. I'm really pleased with it. Um, we've got random kale plants literally everywhere, like the ones down at the bottom there. Um, courgettes and more carrots here, and more calendula. Um, some mizuna lettuce, which is bolted, but I'm leaving it because we're not ready to eat it yet, and it's quite pretty. Um, the garlic are doing well. This one down here is doing slightly strange things. The one on the right, I'm not sure what the stem's doing there. It's sort of Frankensteining itself a bit. Um, I don't know if you can see in under there, but we've got some really nice big healthy rhubarb, which I'm quite pleased with because we only plant all of this we've only planted this year. Um, so I'm very pleased with how the border's looking at the moment. Um, so we've got ridiculous amounts of calendula, which are all from seeds that I gathered in the front drive, which had just self-seeded out there. Um, you can see a few of them. This one here are beginning to go over, and so I'll harvest those in a bit to use for dyeing. Um, I like to wait until they're just about to go over, when I would be sort of deadheading them anyway. Um, the planting is a bit random. Uh, well, no, in terms of spacing, a lot of things are either too close together or too far apart. Um, this bit here at the front um, is very recently planted. We only planted that last week um, because the line of the border used to be along there. And so we sort of move things around a little. Um, so hopefully these will fill out a bit. Um, hollyhock at the back there is very lush in foliage but not really doing anything flower wise and there's another one just there um that one is i don't know if you can see just in there it's just beginning to bud um so fingers crossed we will actually get some flowers this year so that one's going to be a purple one like really dark it's called nigra which is um it's a very dark sort of purpley black uh which isn't a color i would have included in the border with the color scheme as it is um but we will be having some more purpley tones coming through later in the summer uh, with the verbena here as well which you can't really see because it's just long skinny spikes um so we've got lots of calendula i'm really liking how these ones are coming out so pom pom -y and lush. Um, it's, they're just completely beautiful and the ones out the front never really did anything that impressive. And they almost, 
they sort of have a bit of a glow around the edges of the petals in some lights. It's lovely. And then we've got some yellow ones too. And we've got lots of Coreopsis. I'm really pleased with how the Coreopsis is coming out. It's flowering wonderfully. Um, and we've got another one there. And so these will all give um, really nice sort of golden yellowy shades and I'll be playing with different mordants and modifiers to try and shift the colours and see which direction they go in. Um, I've already been collecting a few and we'll see how they are. I do just at the back there, I've just remembered. Just in that little lonely patch there I've got a few woad plants which had been growing uh, in a pot and I just kind of emptied out the whole thing into the ground there because I wasn't sure if they were actually going to make it. Uh, but now that they're looking healthy I might sort of dig up some and prick them out. Um, enjoying the lupins, the babascum there has been completely got by caterpillars. Um, this one at the front here, the Achillea yarrow. Um, is also going to give a nice yellow. I'm letting it establish itself a bit more before I start harvesting any of it. Um, and you know we've got quite a few nice buds coming out here so when it's done a bit more flowering um, I'll start harvesting some and do some experiments with that because I've not dyed with it before. Um, and then this is at the end of the garden where the nasturtiums get a bit more impressive so I've sort of come up with this string situation to try and train them up the fence because I mean we've got a lot of fence. Uh, then we've got our potato plants, the flowers are just beginning to die off um, which hopefully means that soon we will be able to harvest them. I mean they've got quite impressive there sort of mid-thigh height now. Um, this is the nasturtium I'm calling the unit because it's just gone for it. I'm quite keen for that to just cover up that whole bit of fence. It's going to be exciting. Um, and then that's the Thumbergia. The orange one seems to be doing a lot better than the red one. I'm not really sure why. Um, but we'll see how that progresses throughout the summer. Um, And over this side, so hilariously, I can't remember if I mentioned last time that the gooseberry got all pigeoned, but way down in there, oh, where's it gone? Can you see that? It's just a single gooseberry that has managed to hide under all of the leaves. So we're treasuring that one. Um, I think we might have to fight over who gets to eat it. Um, some flowers here are doing nicely. Uh, they're sort of about the same height as the potatoes. Um, and again, lots of nasturtiums behind them that hopefully will make things look nice later in the summer. Then lots more Mizuna lettuce. Um, in between, we've got little rows of carrots. Um, we're not thinning out the Mizuna yet, just because um, it acts as a bit of a trap crop for snails and slugs, because they love this corner over here. Um, you can see just little rows of carrots hiding in there. These ones will need a little bit of thinning out. Um, baby squashes hiding in there. Uh, these are kind of backups because we have other bigger squashes. Um, I really like the yellow flowers on these. They're very pretty. Um, lots and lots of chamomile. The chamomile's really gone for it. I'm quite pleased. Um, oh, and we do have a little row of dill back there. Um, I've been harvesting the chamomile for tea and it's not, I don't, it's not dye as chamomile but I might try dyeing with it anyway just to see what happens. I mean there are so many things that 
just kind of give some shade of yellow so we'll see and then we've got squash down in the bottom left corner there and then lots of beans and corn um, we, all, we have climbing beans and dwarf beans in here so those are the climbing ones and then the rest over in this part are dwarf beans um, and the squash is in these little pockety bits up the front. Um, I'm not quite sure how they're doing. Their stems seem to be a little bit split and we've never really had much luck with squashes in the past. Um, but we will see. And then we've got our honeysuckle, which has not done very well at all. It got powdery mildew. The bits at the top seem to have escaped it, um, but is a bit sorry for itself. I'm hoping that once it's established, like next year, it'll struggle a bit less and be happier about life. Um, we keep getting these little wild poppies showing up, which is really lovely. Um, got another slow or blackthorn there. We just got a lot of bare root ones. Um, so we're, we've just sort of dotted them around in the hopes of eventually mitigating some of the wind. Little herb patch with random paving slabs. Uh, we've got lemon balm. The creeping thyme is just beginning to flower, which is quite lovely. I think I am actually going to change this bit. Um, and I'm going to take, if I go over here, look down into the garden so this is I'm standing by our back gate uh, which goes down the side of the house I'm thinking of taking this little bit of bed here but making it sweep out sort of at the same angle as the edge of the deck there making it sweep out and then curb in there just to try and get away from the feeling of a rectangle and also I'm running out of planting space so I need to create new space to grow things in. Um, so yeah it's all it's all quite nice and I'm really pleased with how the border is coming along. I have focused on the sort of yellowy orange colours because they're my favourite um, but hopefully with the madder and the woad I will have a really nice collection of colours and be able to, fingers crossed, get a decent range. Um, yeah. So one last thing before I finish up this episode, uh, I have some linen fabric which was an old tablecloth of my mother's I think, um, which at some point in the past had been stained quite badly and so years ago I tried over dyeing it, not massively successfully and it came out quite a pale blue but that blue stuck. Um, I wanted to try natural dyeing on top of it for a costume party I'm doing this weekend and I read in my favourite natural dye book by Violetta Thurston which I've talked about before um, that there's an old French method for scouring cotton and linen for natural dyeing which involves chopping up sorrel so French sorrel not garden sorrel or dock um, chopping up sorrel and boiling it with the fabric and so I thought I'd give it a go because 
as I mentioned in the garden tour which I filmed earlier today um, I have some dock that is uh, some sorrel that is bolting so I chopped off some of it uh, chucked it in one of my big pans put in some boiling water put in the fabric left it to boil for a while and I was just expecting that to clean out any residual dirt or anything from the fibre um, just so it would take the dye nicely. What I didn't expect was the for the fabric to come out completely white which is really exciting because it gives me an entirely blank slate to work on um, and that kind of fascinated me so I thought I would look up why that is and sorrel apparently contains oxalic oxalic acid which is what is used uh, is what's in rhubarb leaves and is therefore used as a bleaching agent and also as a mordant for natural dyeing so that was a fun little thing to find out so if you happen to have french sorrel um the the sort of lemony slightly bitter sour tasting one um you can use that uh, to to clean things which I'm very excited about apparently also good for removing rust and polishing marble statues who knew um so yeah that that's a fun little thing that I found out today I like learning new things and I like the way that Violetta Thurston in her books will just throw in half a sentence about something that can then lead to finding out so many more things um which is always an enjoyable part of this process. So on that note, uh, well usually when I finish up, when I show natural dyeing on the podcast uh, with the eucalyptus dye earlier, I do like to show the finished result. Um, I started doing the dyeing and everything and all the footage you saw there was yesterday and the yarn is still in the pots with the eucalyptus because I remembered that um, I had read that eucalyptus can be heated up and cooled multiple times to get a stronger colour. So over the past 24 hours or so I've been doing that. I've been bringing the pot almost up to boiling and then taking it outside to cool down um, and at the moment it's a strong mustardy colour which is quite exciting I am really hoping for an orange but it looks like that might be a bit ambitious um, but yes so we'll see so yeah that I think is all for this time if you do want to see how it turns out um, I will be posting on Instagram so if you follow me over there you can catch a photo probably in a couple of days time uh, and yes so thank you very much for watching um, as I've mentioned you can find me on Instagram you can hear from me in between podcast episodes on my newsletter where you can sign up on my website um, if you're not already subscribed please do do go ahead and do so um, just because it means that you'll see my videos when they come out um, and if you have enjoyed the podcast, if you've learned anything and found it interesting and can also afford and want to do so, I do have a coffee page which helps me set aside the time for the podcast. Um, so anyone who's already donated there, it's so appreciated and really lovely. And so yeah, I've enjoyed this as always and I really hope you have too. All right, bye for now. <laughs>